Well, I'm going to start by telling you a story first. In 1981, I was working for Doug Master, and I didn't know anything about the Olympics. So I was reassigned to a new job. And Doug said, Barking will study the dive sea lines at San Clemente Island and come and see how that goes. And he said, Call Brent Stewart and go see and talk to him, and he'll tell you what to do. So I don't know if Brent should remember this or not. So I called Brent out. And then Brent was supposed to come see you. And he said, Sure, come on over. So he showed me a bucket full of soaking scat samples. He said, This is how you start off. And then uh, he showed me some sieves. He washed them through sieves. And then he showed me these vials with odorless. So he picked these up. Another vial with a bunch of squid beaks. So you get these. That's all you need to know. <laughs> so I'm 30 some years later, I'm still doing it. <laughs> Okay, so my studies first, I started at San Clemente Island in 1981. Then I also got a hold of some samples from San Nicolas Island from various people, Brent being one of those. Eventually, uh, at San Nicolas Island, I increased my sample size and sampling over there, so I'll show you in a little bit. But basically, I have two sample sizes at San Nicolas Island and one at San, San Clemente Island. Okay, uh, from uh, 1981 to about the summer of 2007, I used to do monthly uh, collections. I mean, that's, these are the, the samples that I have right now. Uh, I did monthly collections up to 86, and then after that, there were quarterly collections. Um, basically, I collect in January, April, July, and October. Uh, I collect 50 samples at San Clemente Island. Then St. Nicholas Island, there were monthly and seasonal collections from 81 to 90. And starting in 91, I started the quarterly sampling scheme over there, and then I increased it to the two different areas that I uh, sampled. These two areas, they're all like about a mile and a half apart from each other. Okay, uh, quickly uh, through the methods. Yeah, I collect samples and I, I sift them through uh, mesh screens. I used to do the smallest one, the most important one that you use. Uh, I used to do it with a 0.7 millimeter mesh until about 2005, and I changed to a half a millimeter because I wanted to see what that would do. And all I get more is tablets from squid. Uh, species identifying from fish odorless, squid beaks, uh, shark teeth, and exos crustacean exoskeletal remains, which is mostly just pelagic red crab fragments. These all go into this action data database, and then I have some programs that summarize the data. Well, the summaries, I'm only going to show you the split uh, sample frequency of occurrence, which uh, I, I use SFO percent. And this basically estimates the percentage of the prey species in the diet. And this is a good index because you can add up these percentages and add up to 100%. Whereas if you use like frequency of occurrence, they don't add up to 100%. Uh, the next thing <coughs> I do is I, I measure all this in squid beaks. But for uh, squid beaks, they're not really affected by digestion. And from these measurements, I estimate sizes of the squid and the, and the fish. The problem is with fish is that when the oldest go through the digestive system, they, they dissolve somewhat. So I categorize them by certain classifications. And so I have a class one that basically look just like the ones that can come out of a fresh fish. And then class twos and threes, there's a uh, their level of degradation increases as you go up from two to three. And then class fours, I don't measure, I don't measure those because they're just too dissolved. The way I find out these uh, correction factors is I've gotten, I get an uh, oil list from fresh fish and I uh, put them in a three to five percent solution of hydrochloric acid and I watch them on a like the bowl and I stop the, the reaction with a solution of baking soda, and I look at it on the microscope, and I see what the characteristics are. They're being dissolved away, then I measure them. And I just keep doing that until, actually, until we get to the class four. So basically, what it comes out to is that the class twos, they're right around the uh, reduction in size about 3% or so. And then class threes, they're reduced right around 15%. Class fours, they're like 25 or 30%. So that's why I don't use those. Well, the analysis, now uh, the SFO percentages, you're not supposed to do ANOVAs and all kinds of stuff on uh, proportions, so you gotta 
Arkstein transformed those, so I went out to radians, then I converted the radians to degrees. And I used the Arkstein transform data for all my analysis. Also, I did a piercing correlations and multiple linear regression, mainly just look at the R from the correlations and, and using the R squared value from the multiple uh, regressions to tell me what the fit was. Okay, so from 81 to 2007, basically 12 and a half thousand samples have brain items identified, either the species or the, to, to the family level. Uh, there's an additional 10% that were collected that don't yield any information. So a lot of these uh, I've identified so far 128 species, some down, uh, 20 down to genus, and eight just to the family level. Okay, from uh, 8187, the uh, species you see here, those are the ones that what I call the preferred prey. Those are always show up. In just throughout uh, the years in the diet. Uh, the biggest, uh, they're not separate, they don't the, each island. Uh, you see the frequency of occurrence, and, and I'm comparing the SFO split frequency of occurrence percentage so you can get an idea as to the differences between the two. Basically, the SFO percent is about half of what the frequency of occurrence is. Uh, in order of uh, the hierarchy of the ones that have the most value. I'll start with Marcus Quinn at the top until it gets lower down to the Pacific Macro. Uh, Marcus Quinn has been one of the biggest uh, prey items this last few years, as, I, as we go and see. Uh, Chevrolet Rockfish, I have that in quotation, and I have the other two in the, in the blue, the Chevrolet Rockfish that I identified down to the species level. Then the little, little given over Rockfish, uh, Odalis, I lump them together and separate them between the, uh, the, the short bellies because these little guys look, the old ones look just like the short belly rockfish. And there's some other slight differences, but mainly they look like short bellies. So uh, what you see in the short belly quotations is the sum of the two uh, of the values in, the, in color below them. Okay, for, uh, for the rest of the slides, Basically, I've organ organized them like uh, Market Squid and Pacific Hake. Uh, those are, I don't have any abundance estimates. So what I did is I, I got abundance estimates, population biomass estimates for some of these species. And those, the ones that are in red are the ones that have biomass estimates. So I can compare what the sea lions are eating and see you know, how does that compare to the population of the prey. Whereas in the other species, I don't. Uh, Oh, I don't have that. Uh, and the market squid, I'm just going to show because it's the main prey item. Pacific hay, because there's some interesting aspects that are dynamics that are going on with that diet. And the other ones in black, I have slides here for them, but I'm going to leave them toward the end of the talk, and if there's time, I can show you if you want to see. So I'll start off with the market squid. Okay, the top uh, figures on the left is St. Clemente Island, on the right is St. Nicholas Island. The blue bars, those are the seasonal collections for the market squid, and uh, that's the four percentage value. And then the red line is a smooth line of all those, of all those values. Now I started using the smoothers a few years ago, because what it does is start looking, it starts showing long-term trends and, and what the patterns are, what they're eating. So as you see here, there's all these dips in both islands, and pretty much uh, follow each other except for the very end since 2005 that they don't quite match. But all those little dips they all correspond to El Nino's. So there's an El Nino and market squid drops in their diet and it comes back up. And also the big tall bars you see, those are mainly uh, the winter. Uh, they eat a lot of market squid during the winter and also during the fall. So as you can see those figures in the bottom left, it shows the seasonal average starting off with the winter, spring, summer, and autumn. And as you can see that the winter valleys are the highest. And Lord and behold, with that ANOVA there on the bottom uh, right shows that there are significant seasonal differences. But there's no significant, uh, many differences between islands and that. One of the other things that you see, uh, 
that's different is those last few years, they're starting like about 2005 and six. Is the valleys at St. Mary Island are a lot higher than the ones at uh, San Nicolas Island. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, but uh, I'll have to look into that. Um, see what the other samples that I have collected since then there in the freezer, see what they say. Okay, these are the, the measurements. Again, on the left and the right of San Clemente and San Nicolas Island. Basically shows more or less a normal distribution of the measurements. Uh, they're a little bit slightly bigger at San Clemente Island. We need about uh, 14 centimeters, whereas at San Nicolas Island, about 13 centimeters. There's uh, seasonal and island differences in the sizes between the two islands. Okay, uh, northern anchovy. So like the, the interesting thing about northern anch about anchovies is that in the beginning you can see the big giant peak up there and then it drops off to almost nothing and it's starting to come back. Well back in the first, in that period, we thought that's all they ate, those anchovies. And it turns out that, well it was like a regime shift there in the 90s into, uh, if I remember right, a warm water regime. And it is the anchovy switch with sardines. Maybe we'll see that later on. Okay, there's uh, significant seasonal differences. Uh, mainly, uh, as you really see it at that, on the Saguenay Island side, is in springtime. That's when I, I usually see them, a lot of anchovies in the diet. And not so much at San, San, uh, San Nicolas Island, but still a little bit higher at San Nicolas Island than at San Clemente Island. Okay, the sizes, got them uh, at San Clemente Island by model, and, and it's skewed at San Nicolas Island towards the small size. Uh, the average is a little bit bigger at San Clemente Island, about 12 to 12 and a half centimeters on average, and at San Nicolas Island, about eight, or 11 to almost 12 centimeters on average. As you can see, the on the bottom left of the graphs there are seasonal. Uh, there's a lot of variability in the, in the summer uh, sizes of the, of the anchovies. They pretty much uh, follow both islands. Uh, there's seasonal differences and island differences in the sizes of, of uh, anchovies between, you know, between the, two, the two islands. And this is where we start getting into some comparison of uh, the anchovies that the sea lions are eating and the and biomass estimates. Okay, now, there's two biomass estimates uh, that I've been able to find. One is the Jacobson 95, that's the black line that you see. Uh, the red line is a more current one by Fissel et al. in 2011. Then on the right, we have these, all these correlation values and uh, multiple regression uh, with R squared values. And what it comes down to is that uh, there's real good correlations with uh, biomass, especially with uh, the estimates from Jacobson with what the sea lines are. So all the little yellow, the yellow uh, highlights, those are showing the, the best correlations. Also, I've got a catch in there how much the commercial fisheries catching and uh, there are very low correlations with uh, the commercial fishery with what the sea lines are eating. Pacific sardine, as you can see, remember all the uh, anchovies, they started off like a whole bunch of them and they dropped off, well sardines took over. That's where you have that regime shift into uh, the warm water uh, periods. Uh, the red line is like this, the, uh, like I said, mentioned before, it's the smoother, so like there's two periods there, so it looks like that there was a high abundance in uh, the diet of uh, sardines, and then it drops down really low in the early 2000s, and then it goes back up. Uh, they don't appear, doesn't appear to be any uh, seasonal or island uh, differences in uh, occurrence of sardines in the diet between the two islands. Uh, the sizes, 
Um, so they're slightly bimodal, as you can see at Sanctuary Island. There's a lot of small ones that get eaten there, and also at, uh, at San Nicholas Island. But for the most part, the average median size are pretty much the same size. But there are uh, significant differences in between even season and island and, and seasonal island effects also uh, in the sizes of the sardines that are in the island season. Yeah, sardine abundance. This is the one I really like the best. It really follows it pretty well. As you can see, the black line is the abundance estimates. That's just total abundance. I didn't put in. I also have uh, abundance estimates uh, by age class. We have age zero, one, two, three, four, and, and five. And as you can see, uh, there's really high correlation with age, age zero uh, abundance estimates with what the sea lions are eating. Uh, a little bit with age ones and age twos also some correlations there depending on what season it is. Also, uh, it's really well correlated with total abundance. So the sea lions that you need to really follow quite closely the abundance, the total abundance of sardines. And the catches also, when you compare the catch of sardines from the commercial fishery to uh, what the sea lions are eating, it matches pretty well. Uh, um, I put this one here just so you can see all the different uh, age classes. So I compare the correlations with uh, also the uh, coefficient of determinations, the R squared from the uh, regressions. Uh, in the regressions, the, there's two uh, parts. One, is a multi one uses all the seasons, as you can see there, and then the other one I did uh, stepwise to see if I could identify, identify which seasons really I have the high best correlations with, uh, with what the uh, sea lions are eating. And as you can see, um, basically, the, uh, like I said, the total biomass and age zero biomass and the multiple uh, regressions coming up stand out as being highly correlated with what the sea lions are eating. Also the catch and, and uh, starting uh, biomass. And a lot of these are Mostly, I, uh, the stepwise picks a lot of times the, depending on the size class uh, or the age class, you know, mostly winter and, and fall or spring and autumn. We have Pacific macro. So you can see there's no real pattern. Uh, you know, although I, there's seasonal differences there. You can see the increase in, in, in occurrence as you go up, uh, from winter to springtime. But there's no island differences. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of peaks and valleys, ups and downs throughout the years. Yeah, uh, the size is pretty much normally distributed in the two. Uh, the sizes are almost the same. Right around 24 uh, centimeters at uh, average at San Clemente Island and about 22 centimeters at San Nicolas Island. There are uh, significant differences between the seasons and islands with the sizes of the Pacific mackerel that are in the diet of the sea lions. Uh, I'll put this one in here. Uh, I didn't do that for the other ones except for the uh, hay. Just so you can see the the history, the pattern of the sizes throughout the, all the years, what it means so much. Because you can see there's a lot of variability there. There's no clear pattern of uh, what sizes are eating. Sometimes the big ones or little ones. It varies. Uh, then, when to compare the uh, principal percentage to uh, the abundance estimates, they don't really match up very well at all. Only like the winter at San Clemente Island, you have a decent correlation. Okay, and now uh, Pacific Hay. So you can see the, at, at San Clemente Island and San Nicolas Island, the, uh, the long term trends, they don't really match up. But there's a lot of ups and a lot of downs. <coughs> There are no differences in the seasons, but there are island differences between the two. And 
and the size of the squids are really skewed towards the smaller <coughs> size uh, of, of hay. You see the medium a uh, little bit bigger at San uh, uh, Mary Island, averaging with 11 to 12 centimeters, and at San Nicolas Island, they average about 9 to 10 uh, centimeters. There are seasonal and island differences for all of these. And this is the part I like, this is the reason I wanted to show you the previous one why I'm showing you this one. Now if you look at these guys, here you see all these slanted, uh, if you look at the, uh, the main dots, they all slant towards from the bottom to the top right. And those are cohorts, so you, you, you start seeing the little guys, they'll eat the little guys, and then the next, the next season they get a little bit bigger, and they get a little bit bigger, and it runs for about two and a half to three years, then they disappear. And then another, then, no, then another year or two, several years later, a strong cohort shows up, and the same you see, you see the same pattern again. That's why on that first slide you see the, all the sizes that are all skewed towards the really small ones, because that's what's going on. And it happens, happens that the biology of uh, okay, is that the big ones, the adults, they come down to the bite. That's where they spawn away offshore. Then they stay along the bite for two to three years, and then they start migrating north. So those are the ones that the sea lions are eating, the ones that are still in the area before they start out migrating. And here I put everything together, all the, uh, the smooth lines for the main prey, uh, those preferred prey. And also I added another one there, the other prey ones. They're kind of hard to see. But uh, then the arrows, those are El Ninos just to give an idea as to what is going on. So as you can see, okay, here's the anchovies. It drops off on both of them. Then uh, you see the, this green uh, dash line, that's the sardines. So anchovies drop, sardines flips over through the ups and downs. Uh, for the El Ninos, the interesting one is the blue one, the other prey is, okay, during El Ninos it's elevated and then it drops down. <coughs> then it gets elevated again. During uh, El, this El Nino, the others also gets elevated here again. Not so much at San Nicolas Island, but at San Comeni Island, it's really following the gap pattern really well. So that when there's El Ninos, they start eating anything and everything they can get a hold of because the main preferred prey on is uh, as abundant. So they start going and they eat almost eat everything. That's why I have 128 species that they have. And so what happens is that they're just, basically they're switch feeders. So when there are a bunch of their, what I call the predominant prey, which at first was anchovies, and now it's, uh, it's uh, market squid. When those start dropping, all the other ones start elevating. And uh, the sizes, <coughs> this is all, all the ones that I have measured so far, like about 109,000. Measurements. Most of those are squid, because I measure a lot of squid. They don't take so much of it. But basically, they're they're targeting you know a squid that are, or a fish and squid that are like 13 centimeters long. That's like five and a half inches. So basically, what sea lions are eating at these two islands are small pelagics, squid fishes, or squid that aggregate at about that size. They do eat the bigger ones, but it's very rare. And those really big ones towards way in the end on the right side, those are the humble squid that they're eating. And they don't eat very many of those, but they eat the smaller ones. Of those. Okay, so our conclusions. Okay, well, like I said, Northern anchovies was beyond the prey in the 80s. And now market squid took over in the 1990s and the 2000s. And then when uh, consumption of predominant prey decreased, all the other ones, and their preferred prey uh, are, are increased in the diet, especially hay and short, short belly rockfish and, and sardine. Uh, also, the abundance of some of these pro their prey in the ecosystem is reflected in the diet. So, if there's these cooling fishes that they're very abundant, that's what they're going after. Same thing with squid. Also, oceanographic conditions do affect the diet as I've shown with the market squid and also with that other prey. Uh, Acknowledgements. Well, I've been all, throughout the years, there's been a lot of people that have helped me collect scat samples and, uh, and 
and uh, sit them to the sits. Also, I uh, couldn't do the as work if it wasn't for the U.S. Navy that helps me out at the same community online and the same as the site. 